Hey, welcome to the online campus at Compass. Our mission is navigating people to God. We are one church in thousands of locations, and that includes you from wherever you're tuning in from. My name is Brooks. I'm the online campus pastor, and I'm so glad that you've decided to join us today for the experience. Now, listen, we kick off a brand new series today called Countdown to C Christmas is here. Countdown to Christmas. That's the name of our series. It is here. Finally, it didn't really feel like Christmas was ever going to get here, which is just crazy, but it is here. I can't believe it's here. It feels like the year has just flown by. But listen, very first week of this series, and we are live here at our Roanoke location waiting for service to start. So this is the first time that we've gone to another campus. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. Now, what I would love for you to do uh, is just let us know if you are a first, second, or third time guest. Maybe you live here in DFW. Maybe you moved here recently. Uh, maybe you live close to Roanoke or the North Fort Worth area. Man, make sure you say hi in the chat. And I would love for you to scan the QR code that just popped up next to me, or you can click on the link in the chat, however you want to do it. When you scan that QR code, it's actually going to take you to a link tree. Okay, and this link tree, you're gonna see first time guest and gift. I would love for you to click that because I'm, I'm gonna send you a gift as a way of saying thank you for joining us today for the experience. That gift, it is a red journal because it's Christmas time. And I love, you know, obviously Chris, Christmas is like, you know, red, green, and white. So it's, it's a red journal. Gonna send that to you as a way of saying thank you for joining us today. But also what it does, and it's really my favorite part of this, is that it allows me the opportunity to reach out to you and see how I can pray for you because I really think we could all use more prayer, especially during this season. Maybe some of you are going through some difficult times. Maybe you're away from family in this season. Maybe there's some family mess going on, whatever it is that's going on in your life. Maybe you're sick and that's why you're joining us online. I would love for you to scan that, hit first time guessing if let me reach out to you and pray with you this week. Now, remember we, we finished our series 1000 tables okay and if you remember we were offering this challenge and this challenge is not done just because that series is is finished and we're kicking off christmas listen we have this going on all the way to easter okay all of it's going on till easter which means how is the first name challenge going are you guys learning the first names of your neighbors now if you remember we have this graphic and the graphic is your house in the center with the eight closest neighbors around you. How are you doing with that? Are you remembering or are you gathering the names of your neighbors? And remember the other part of this challenge, okay? Have you invited them over for a meal yet? Have you done that? If you haven't, and maybe you haven't even committed, I would love for you to go ahead and I would love for you to commit to hosting a meal with your neighbors. And you can do that by texting table to 31329. You can text TABLE to 31329. And man, when you commit to doing that and you commit to learning the first names of your neighbors, powerful things can happen as we heard in our Thousand Table series. So we would love for you to go ahead, commit to that. And man, uh, what we're gonna do, you're gonna take a picture of that meal time. We're gonna print it out and we're gonna put it in our studio. We have some already. It's so exciting to see what God is doing locally, nationally, and internationally with those of you that are beginning to learn your neighbors. And actually some of you have invited your community, your neighbors to watch online, which I think is so cool. So that props to you guys for doing that. I think that is absolutely amazing. Now, look, like I said, we're in our series countdown to Christmas. And here's what we're doing is we're celebrating Advent for the next four weeks. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you have done this before. Maybe you've done the Advent tradition. I didn't do this growing up, but I know a lot of you have where, you know, you've got the wreath laying on the table, right? It's a wreath and it's round, which represents the, the eternal life that we have with God. And then there's four <laughs> candles. There's four candles, sometimes five, but each candle represents one, <laughs> one represents prophecy, one represents Bethlehem, the shepherd candle, the angel candle, and sometimes the fifth one is the Christ candle. Today, we're looking at the prophecy candle, which represents hope. It represents hope and the hope that we have in Jesus. So we have a powerful message today that I can't wait for you to hear. Now, like I said, we are live here at Roanoke. 
And I just want you to take a minute and look at how beautiful this campus is. They, they don't mess around when it comes to Christmas, man. They up the ante for all of us when it comes to Christmas. Check out some of what they've got here at Roanoke. Their Christmas trees are absolutely gorgeous. They're all decorated. They're completely decorated out here at Roanoke. I love it. And it just looks so beautiful. So props to the Roanoke team for how they've decorated this year. Very festive. And you can even see as we're waiting for the service to start. I mean, people are just very excited to be here today uh, to hear from their pastor at the Roanoke campus, Josh Wright. But I'm excited for the message that you're going to hear today from Pastor Drew. It's going to be so powerful and really glad that you're here. And by the way, uh, if you're just joining us right now, welcome to the online campus at Compass. Our mission is navigating people to God. We're one church in thousands of locations. That includes you from wherever you are tuning in from. My name is Brooks. I'm the online campus pastor. Now I'm really glad that you're here. And if you didn't hear already, we are here at our Roanoke campus as we kick off our series, Countdown to Christmas. We just finished our thousand table series where we've challenged you to get together with your neighbors and to get together, have a meal with them and get to know them. And, and that is not that is not ending at all. Now, I've got a question for you guys as we are starting starting this series out. Here's the question. So get your texting fingers ready or your typing fingers ready. Okay. Here's the question. What is your favorite Christmas hymn? I would love, love to see the comments in the chat right now for this. What is your favorite Christmas hymn? Uh, there's lots of them. There's a lot of great hymns. So let me see some of those right now as you're joining us. And, and by the way, if you are just joining us, make sure you say hello in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. We've got chat hosts that are ready to pray with you, that are ready to encourage you, whatever situation or circumstance you are finding yourself in today. I said it earlier and I'll say it again. Honestly, this is a very difficult time of year for many of you. So listen, our chat hosts will pray with you through this. They Let them know what's going on. Let them know you need prayer and they will pray with you. Reach out. You can do that right now in the chat. And maybe you're joining us on YouTube or you're joining us on your TV. Man, get on your smartphone, get on your computer, and you can go to compasschurch.online. You can create a quick guest username and join us there. And just say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Would love to say hi. So favorite Christmas hymns. Let's see them. Okay, I'm going to tell you what, what my favorite Christmas hymn is, okay? My favorite Christmas hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I love that. Uh, and I think it pairs really nicely with what we're learning today about the hope that we have in Jesus. I really think it, it pairs very well because that whole hymn is about expectation. The expectation of Jesus, not just what he's doing now, but what he is going to do in the future. You know, us living in this already and not yet existence as believers. And that even though his, his dwelling and his spirit is here and now, and you could feel it this time of year, uh, very powerfully, we know what to expect going forward. And that is that he is going to come back and he is going to redeem all of us, regardless of where we are and what has happened. Now, what I would love to do is read from you one of my favorite, favorite verses. And it comes from Micah 5, 2. And I can see some of you guys. Now, I love some of those hymns that I'm seeing. So here's, here's what I love. Micah 5, 2. It says this. You can follow along with me if you'd like. It's called A Ruler from Bethlehem in Micah 5, 2. Now, this was written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. Okay? So this is a, this is a piece of prophetic literature. But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last, his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land, and he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world and he will be the source of peace. And I just, I love that because that is exactly what we're going to be worshiping about today and talking about today with Pastor Drew and at all of our campuses. 
talking about that hope that we have. So today is about having hope. We're looking at the prophecy candle as we're celebrating Advent for this series because it reminds us of the hope of his coming. Well, hey guys, go ahead and prepare a space where you can worship right now. We're going to go ahead and jump into that worship. Stick around for post show because I have a special guest. We're going to talk a little bit about what we heard and hear a little bit more about the Rono campus, which we're live at now. Welcome to the online campus at Compass. have a seat. Welcome to Compass. Our mission is navigating people to God. We are one church in multiple locations. And whether you're in the room or online, you are in for a treat because obviously it is Kids Worship Weekend. And once again, these kids have captured my heart. Their hard work, their enthusiasm has given me a genuine anticipation for this Christmas season. And before we go on, I wanted to give you a couple fun facts about kids worship and how God has grown this ministry. So growing up, my mom was the music director at my church, and I have two really great memories, one of which is uh, when she directed the handbell choir. I miss a good handbell, okay? And the other was when she directed our kids' choir, and that was the first time I ever had a solo, and I just knew that I was meant to praise the Lord. And um, so in 2016, we have a class here, a discipleship um, class called Rooted. And so I was going through Rooted here at Compass, and some of my group and these um, leaders at Compass, they just were encouraging me to um, just, what does kids' worship look like? What is that? So I started praying about it. Obviously, God said, we, need, we want this. He wants this, right? Um, and so I immediately called who? My mom. 
So I call my mom. I'm like, hey, I think you're retired, but not anymore. So since day one, I've been doing this with my mom, and this is just a really precious time for us. We also have four other directors that have joined us, and right now at our North Richland Hills campus, they have kids worship too. So it's incredible how kids worship is impacting our community. We also have what we call student directors, and most of them actually started in kids' worship, and now they've grown up and they're in student ministry. But when it's kids' worship time, they come back and they serve and they lead alongside us. And let me tell you something, guys. Guess how many we have this year? We have a record-breaking number. 26 student directors wake up early on Sunday, stay late on Sunday to be with these kids. Y'all, it's amazing. And last but not least, we're always trying to find creative and inclusive ways to just teach worship. Because in my heart, I want everyone to know that praising Jesus is way more than notes and lyrics. And that's why I love our partnership with the Compass Deaf Ministry. In addition to adding some sign language to our songs, we have precious kids from the Deaf Ministry who are part of kids worship. So that is super exciting for me as well. And it's full circle moments like this, reflecting on what God has done that just turns my heart and praise towards him. And I can't help but thank God for sending us the greatest gift, his son Jesus in the the unexpected body of a child to be the savior of the world. So before we go on, will you please bow your heads and pray with us before these children lead us into the presence of God. Dear God, thank you for this day. Let Let us have the best two performances, amen.
I'm Mary, mother of Jesus. I'm Joseph of Nazareth. And this is our unstoppable journey. Joseph and I were like most Jewish teenagers. I gave her dad some goats and we're gonna get married. Yep, that's exactly how it went. Well, all that changed when an angel came. An angel, you know, dressed in white, glowing. He said I was going to give birth to God's son and I was to name him Jesus. Now, I was a little surprised. Another angel visited me in Morocco after that. Joseph and I got married, and then there was a censorous, and we had to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That's 90 miles walking. Thankfully, I had a donkey, but I was still really pregnant back then. When we got to Bethlehem, we were going to stay with some family. They were so full, we looked everywhere. I was tired and hungry. You were hungry. I was hungry. We finally found someone who had a barn. We were getting all ready for bed, and that's when things got real. Mary had baby Jesus. It was the best moment of my life. It was the best moment for the entire world. The Messiah was finally here. We were just getting settled and there was this bright star. The shepherd showed up to worship Jesus. Our Jesus. If that wasn't enough, these wise men came with gifts. I think the shepherds are my favorite part other than Jesus being born. They were so excited. What, over the wise man? Yeah. I don't think we realized how much our lives would change because of Jesus. Our perfect son. The world's perfect son. You could have stepped into creation with fire for all to see, but every tribe and nation to their knees, arriving with the host of heaven and royal robe and crown, the rulers of the earth are bowing down. But you chose meekness over man. But you wrote a better story than humble Bethlehem, creator in the arms of calling men. You will die for our redemption, and you'll rise so we can live. Glory be to you alone, King who reigns from to the cradle, from cradle to the cross, let heaven and nature sing, this is our King, but the grave couldn't hold him, our God is overcome, let heaven and nature sing, this is our King, from heaven to the cradle, from cradle to the cross.
can we give one more ginormous round of applause for all of our kids? These kids did four services, by the way. Like, these kids have did amazing. It is quite my favorite thing every service, though, to watch the littles just slowly start to pay attention to the screen that's up here. <laughs> it's the best. We are so fortunate to be able to have kids lead us into the presence of God. And I want us to just take a moment and recognize how incredible that is, that we, as adults, were just led into the presence of God by children and a reminder that we worship a savior who humbly came to earth in the form of a baby, grew up and was once a child just like them, worshiping and praying to the same God that these kids are worshiping and praying to today. And I just think that's such a beautiful part of our savior that we worship, that he is humble and gentle by nature and that these kids are the perfect example of what that looks like. So I'm so grateful for all of them. And just a little fun fact for all of you while they head off the stage. I was once a little kid in the kids choir here at Compass when I was very little, except it looked a little different. All I remember about it is that I sat on stage in a giant cardboard box because I was a present. <laughs> That's all I remember. So I, they fortunately didn't have to do that. But we love that we are so invested in the next generation and we're so proud of them. So as we continue in our service, we are now going to take communion together as a church. This is for anyone that belongs to the body of Christ. So if this is your first time here and you want to join us in communion, please do. We have cups that were available when you walked in. If you did not receive one, you can raise your hand and one of our section hosts will bring that to you. And if you're online, would you grab some bread and juice to join us in this moment as well? And we get to take communion every single week here at Compass because we read in the scriptures that Jesus, when he was with his disciples, took bread and he broke it and he blessed it and said, this is my body, eat this in remembrance of me. And he took a cup of wine and he blessed it and he passed it to his disciples and he said, drink this, this represents my blood, which I'm going to pour out for you as a new covenant, a new promise that there is a hope that you get to carry with you, that you will join me one day in my father's kingdom. And so today, some 2000 years later, we remember that Jesus humbly came as a baby, was raised up knowing about the prophecies of old, knowing that he carried the hope of eternity for all of us and that he willingly went to the cross and sacrificed his body for us. He willingly poured out his blood for us so that you and I can have hope of eternity, that we get to join him at his father's table and kingdom, that there is a seat saved for anyone who would call on him and call him their savior. So during this time of communion, we will pause to just reflect on our own lives, to examine ourselves and to remember that we could not earn this kind of grace. We could not earn our own worth, our own value is only determined by our creator, the one who made heaven and earth and the one who made every single one of us. And he chooses us and he calls us beloved sons and daughters. So as we pray, I would just encourage you after to take communion on your own time and to thank Jesus for his life, for his sacrifice and for his resurrection. So would you pray with me for our time of communion? Father, we thank you so much for the son, Jesus. We thank you that he is gentle and lowly at heart, that he is so compassionate and loving and just to come to earth to save us. And so we just thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Right now, we just reflect on the idea that we could never earn this on our own and you don't ask us to. You sent your son instead to pay the ultimate price for us. And we just say, thank you, Jesus. And we also say, come Lord Jesus. We love you, we want you here with us. And it's in your name that we pray, amen. Here at Compass, we understand that life can sometimes be filled with challenges, uncertainties, and trials. We provide one-to-one -one care to help in these seasons. And people often ask, what exactly is one-to-one -one care? To put it simply, we're a ministry that walks with you through a difficult season of life. 
We're often the after people. After you get the phone call you hoped you'd never get. After the relationship falls apart and the bottom falls out of your life. After the new baby arrives demanding much more of your time than you ever dreamed possible. After you get the unexpected pink slip with your final paycheck. After the last child drives away from home and the house suddenly feels empty. One to One Care is here, ready to come and walk alongside you. We meet with you once a week to provide comfort and support to get you through that tough season of life. If you're looking to seek care, or if you're interested in joining our care team, visit compass.church forward slash one to one. We know that the holiday season for a lot of us is the most wonderful time of the year, but we also know that for a lot of people, this is one of the most difficult times of the year. And so we're really honored that we get to offer this ministry to all of you this Christmas season. So if that is something that you or a loved one are interested in, having someone to walk alongside you through this season, we wanna let you know that we're here and we are available to you. And we also wanna encourage you, if you are interested in being that person who walks alongside someone, it's people from our church Church that do this and we've got training coming up in the new year we would love for you to join us in that so if you're interested in anything related to one-to-one -one care we've got a booth out in the lobby right by that fireplace you can stop by after the service and we would love to connect with you and get you all the information you might need about our ministry and every week at Compass, we wanna say thank you because your generosity makes every ministry that we have here possible, including our one-to-one -one care. We're able to offer this all year long, and we have seen so many lives changed because of this ministry. We've seen marriages come back together. We have seen lives restored and broken hearts healed, and it's all because of this kind of ministry. So we wanna say thank you so much for the work that we get to do and that you do in your partnership with us. So if you're interested in continuing to be generous, there are multiple ways you can do so. You can give online, you could give through the Compass app, or we have these generosity boxes as you exit today. And as always, we want to say thank you so much. And if this is your first or second time here, thank you so much for being here with us today. My name is Laura Collins. I'm on staff here if we haven't had a chance to meet. And we would love to connect with you. So the best way to do that is to use either the QR code that's on the back of the seat in front of you, or you can come meet us after service in guest gathering. It's right out these doors and to the right across from that fireplace. We have a free gift for you. We would love to meet you and we can answer any questions you might have about Compass. So I hope that you'll join us there. And we have a lot coming up in the next month as we've officially hit the Christmas season. I wanna let you know about two things. The first, for all the women in the room, our Hope for the Holidays event is this Tuesday night, right here in this room at 6.30. You do not wanna miss it. We're gonna hang out together. We're gonna hear an incredible message from a woman who is also an author of a beautiful Advent book. So perfect for this season. I hope that you'll be here. I'll be here, so I hope to see you and join us. If you want more information, you can go to compass.church forward slash women to get registered. And then we are just around the corner from our Christmas Eve services. They are on their way. We have nine services right here at our Colleyville campus and online. So I wanna encourage you, maybe you need to take a picture of this slide that has all the service times and start to figure out what service you and your family are going to attend. And then I also would wanna challenge you to serve alongside us and ask you to do that with us. We will have thousands of people come into this building for the very first time on Christmas Eve and we wanna make sure they have a great experience and we need you to make that possible. So please consider serving. And if you wanna register for that, you can go to christmasatcompass.com and find out all sorts of information about our Christmas Eve services. But we also want to just encourage you to be praying about who you're going to invite to a Christmas Eve service. Our mission here is navigating people to God and Christmas Eve is one of the best ways that we can do that. So I wanna just encourage you to ask the Lord who he's placed in your life that he wants you to invite to a Christmas Eve service. We believe that God has placed us here and now for such a time as this. So who is that person that you know needs to hear the good news that comes from Jesus Christ? We just ask that you would be praying and then we are praying for you to have boldness and courage as you help us in fulfilling this mission of navigating all of God's people to Jesus. So we thank you so much for the work that we get to do. Now, we're gonna kick off a brand new series today, but before we do, would you pray with me for our time of generosity? Father, we thank you so much for the ways that you're generous to us. We thank you for the ways that you see us and that you care for us. And so we thank you for ministries like One to One Care, that we get to walk alongside others as you walk alongside us. We thank you for the work that you're doing here locally and around the world. And we ask right now that the gifts that are given would be used in miraculous ways, that you would multiply them to your kingdom's benefit. And we just give you all the glory, Jesus. We love you so much and we trust you. And it's in your name that we pray, amen.
Well, hello, 1130. How are you? All right. All right. Good start. Good start. Well done. I expect more later, but anyway, <laughs> that's good. Hey, welcome to Compass. Our mission is navigating people to God. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Drew. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest, I would love to connect with you after this in guest gathering. It's right across from the uh, fireplace. We'd love to put a name to a face, give you a gift. And I want to welcome our amazing online community today. We love you guys. And thank you to all of you who have signed up for our Thousand Tables gatherings. We're so excited about these gatherings. Um, we have many that have already accomplished this feat and uh, this amazing gathering in our homes, offering a meal to neighbors around us. And so, man, guys, I want to encourage you again, even though the series is over, I am not letting this go, okay? I don't know if you've noticed that. But I need you uh, to be a part of this. Send, I'm gonna, I want you to send a text. Text the word TABLE to 31329. And we'll get you started on this gathering. I think it's going to be incredible. We want everybody to be a part of it. And December's here, which means the Christmas season is upon us. And no doubt you and your family are, are planning and preparing for some Christmas traditions that you're accustomed to. Most of us have at least one Christmas tradition that we sort of observe every year. Uh, maybe you're the family that puts up your Christmas tree the day after Halloween. Uh, anybody out there in that category? Yeah, bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> bless your heart. Or maybe you channel your best Clark Griswold when you put up lights on your house. Uh, stay off those ladders, kids. Stay off the ladders. Uh, maybe you have a wacky gift exchange every year, kind of a white elephant kind of thing. Our family, I, I think you know this, uh, we, we like to eat Chinese food every Christmas Eve. We just do it every year. Uh, we've been doing that for years. And I'm guessing some of you have traditions that go way back. I was curious about like world, like global traditions when it comes to Christmas. And so I was just kind of checking it out on the internet. Did you know, <clears throat> excuse me, did you know that in Greenland, uh, Christmas dinner includes a dish called kiviak? Now, kiviak is made from the raw meat of an auk bird. Kind of looks like a penguin. Uh, kiviak isn't kiviak until the auk meat uh, has been encased in a seal skin and left buried under a stone to rot and decompose for a few months. Who's hungry now? <laughs> right? I mean, nothing says yuletide like eating rotten bird meat from a seal skin. What in the world are these people thinking? Uh, another tradition, two weeks before Christmas, children in the former Yugoslavian Republic will sneak up on their mothers and tie their feet to a chair, and then they'll dance around her singing, Mother's Day, Mother's Day, what will you pay to get away? And then she gives them presents. And I was just thinking, like, if I had tied my mother to a chair at Christmas time. I don't think I would have received presents, all right? I might have received something else. Uh, that's another tradition I don't understand. And then last but not least, in the capital of Venezuela, the streets are closed on Christmas morning so that, so that people can roller skate to church. So that they can roller skate to church. Now, I like this one, right? Like of the three, this is the one I'm doing, okay? Uh, this is a pretty cool tradition. Uh, where am I going with all this? Well, for centuries, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas have been known and celebrated as Advent. It's a tradition that goes back 2,000 years ago. And today we're starting a new series based on this tradition called Countdown to Christmas. Uh, by the way, show of hands, did anyone grow up in a church that really celebrated Advent, traditionally speaking? Yeah. Many of us have. I, I did not grow up in, in that tradition, but if you were a part of a, maybe a more liturgical, more denominational gathering, you probably celebrated Advent at, at length during December. For centuries, Advent, it just means arrival. That's what arrival me, Advent means, was marked as a time for Christians to gather together and to prepare themselves for the birth of Christ, uh, the arrival of Christ. Also, part of that tradition is the Advent wreath, which I have up here uh, with me, and all, also lighting a, a candle each week. Uh, a different candle is lit, and the one in the center, which we're going to be putting there around Christmas Eve time, will be lit on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning. 
And uh, Advent is a wonderful time to kind of connect the light uh, from the candles and the arrival of Jesus. And the first candle that we're going to light today, a little bit later on, will be this, the first candle, the prophecy candle, what is known as the hope candle. And the reason it's known as the hope candle is Old Testament prophets declared that a Messiah was coming. Now, the one you might be most familiar with, if you've studied this, is probably Isaiah. Isaiah first declared that there was going to be a Messiah. Therefore, the Lord himself will give a sign, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. You just saw a funny little video of Mary and Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph, and uh, by the way, they were amazing, I thought, really amazing, hilarious. Yeah, and I liked it that Joseph said that Mary was hangry. I like that. I just like everything about that. But uh, anyway, this is the first time that a prophet would declare this, but the one that's most connect, closely connected to Advent would probably be two chapters later in Isaiah 9. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. So light in the midst of deep darkness, which is amazing. So the first of the candles that we're going to light will represent the hope of Jesus' birth. And hope is a versatile word, isn't it? We, we might uh, say something like, I hope this burrito doesn't give me heartburn. Or I hope I don't get a speeding ticket on Hall Johnson or Poole Road. Right, Just a tip during the holidays, don't speed on Hall Johnson or Poole Road and you'll have a much more merry Christmas this year. Hope is, of course, applied to more serious things. Hope I can find someone to spend my life with. I hope my marriage works out. Hope my kids turn out normal. I hope I have enough money to retire. I hope, I hope, I hope. Human beings are irrepressible hopers. Hope is why kids go nuts on Christmas morning. Hope is why people go on diets in January. Hope is why entrepreneurs start businesses. Hope is why students go to college. Hope is why gamblers go to casinos. Hope is why we are all cowboy fans, <laughs> right? Maybe this will be the one. But the hope of Advent is a lot bigger story than all of that. Advent is meant to reenact the waiting of the people of God before Jesus was born. And it goes back to the beginning of the Bible. If you'll indulge me for just a moment, I want to give you just a very short timeline of Jewish history that led up to Advent. After Genesis and after the flood, the Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt. For hundreds of years, Israel endured slavery with little hope of a better future. But the day came when their hope was actually rewarded, and in the most dramatic fashion, God delivered them from the hand of a ruler named Pharaoh, and then ultimately led his people into Israel, which was called the Promised Land. Now, the Israelites lived in freedom for a few years, but insisted on becoming uh, a nation like other nations in that they wanted a human king. They didn't want just God to be their king. Now, God warned them against this, but he also let them have their wish, and he granted that wish, and God knew best because most of the kings of Israel were known for leading people away from God instead of toward him. Sometimes leaders just do that. David was one of the few exceptions to that. He was the second king of Israel. He became king when the prophet Samuel anointed him with olive oil as a sign that he was chosen by God. Now, in those days, an anointed leader was called, in Hebrew, Meshiach. It's where we get our word in English, Messiah. And with that anointing came the promise that through the lineage of David, through the family tree of David, if you will, would come the family of God. That there would be a dynasty of God's people that would celebrate and worship him as king. And David was a very highly successful king and spiritual leader. He enlarged and secured the borders of Israel, increased her prosperity and her peace. But this was short-lived. In fact, the peace of Israel always seems to be short-lived, as we are seeing even in these days. 
David was succeeded by his son Solomon, which was revered for his wisdom. But over time, Solomon's regime became oppressive. He overtaxed the people, forced forced labor to build the temple, his palace, many other projects, some of which were necessary, some that probably weren't. And his reign was problematic for both God's people and the surrounding nations. So God's people, who were the oppressed people in Egypt for years, have now become the oppressors, and God didn't like that. He wasn't in favor of that, of course. And so Solomon's reign ended in civil war, or a divided kingdom, if you will, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The Assyrians invaded, they took over, oppressed his people. The Babylonians then invaded, took over, and oppressed his people. And Jerusalem, meanwhile, was in ruins, and the temple had been destroyed. And many of the people of Israel were carried off to other nations, right back into slavery, and all seemed lost once again. But hope never died, because God sent prophets to begin telling of a day when he would send another deliverer, a Messiah, a Mashiach, to save the people and bring peace and prosperity once again. Now, if you go a couple more chapters, we did Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, here's Isaiah 11. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for his people. The nations will rally to him, and the resting place will be glorious, and he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He'll assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. What in the world does all that mean? Well, if you pay attention to that first line, the root of Jesse, well, what's that about? Well, Jesse was the name of King David's father, and David was the tribe of Judah. So in short, it's saying that this hope is being rekindled, that a Messiah, an anointed chosen one from David's family, would reunite the kingdom of Israel, rebuild its capital city, and usher in peace and prosperity to bring light into deep darkness. And there you have the entire history of the Old Testament in like four minutes, okay? And here's the thing. Christmas is a great time to talk about the light that hope brings. It's a fun time to get together with family and swap stories. I always loved to hear my parents talk about the good old days. I love that. I couldn't get enough of that stuff. My dad passed away several years ago, but when he was alive, I loved hearing him talk about days gone by and Christmas past. Even today, I love hearing my mom talk about these golden years uh, that were so, so fun and nostalgic. Back when they had kids in the house, I love the story when they were first married. My dad was serving in the armed forces in Germany. And in the early 60s, they were living on the third floor of a house in Germany of this woman named Frau Gabrielle. And they didn't have a refrigerator. They used to open up in the wintertime. They would open up their window sills and just set food out on the on the window. It was just amazing to hear her talk about that. Or when they were trying to raise four kids on a single salary in the 70s, but it, it always seemed like God provided. I remember Christmas traditions well. We opened up one pres- Christmas present each on Christmas Eve, and uh, usually it was like from my grandma who would usually get us like a pair of black socks and a $5 bill, but it was still fun, right? Uh, and then uh, we'd wake up the next morning and there would be a happy birthday Jesus cake and we uh, blow out the candles and we'd eat cake for breakfast. Then we went downstairs and uh, where there was a real Christmas tree and there would be a crackling fire going on. And many times, of course, living in Indiana, we would have a, uh, a white Christmas or even a patchy white Christmas. Uh, and to me, as I look back on that, I think, you know, those were kind of the good old days. And see, after the split of the kingdom, people in Israel looked back on David's regime as the good old days. And they wanted to see Israel unified and secured and at peace with her neighbors once again. But that time never seemed to come. And after Assyria and Babylonian conquered them, then Rome came in all of its splendor. And those who weren't in exile saw their homeland, Israel, occupied by yet another empire. And so there's this series of years that the people of God were waiting for the Mashiach, the Messiah to come. And they had big expectations. They wanted a combination of Mother Teresa and Billy Graham and Winston Churchill, right? Like they, they wanted somebody like that. Now to make matters worse, 
uh, every now and then, some rebel leader would rise up and claim he was the Messiah, and people would rally around him. In fact, there's a, there was a guy around 150 B.C. by the name of Judas Maccabeus, and he was a very strong character, uh, but he led a revolt against the current empire, and his plans were for a liberated Israel, and he had great intentions. He did a good job. Uh, the tra- in fact, the tradition of Hanukkah actually celebrates this victory. Judas Maccabeus led a successful revolt, that is, until he ended up dead, and his revolt was crushed. And this happened over and over again in the history of Israel, just when you became convinced that this is the one, but then whichever foreign empire was in charge would just crush the rebellion and the uprising, and then it would be over. And you'd get your hopes up, and then hope would be taken away from you. And the people living in that day were kind of on a hope roller coaster. Show of hands. Anybody here a roller coaster fan? Raise your hand. I, I really, I would join that number. I love roller coasters. I really do. I don't know why I love them so much. I'm terrified of heights. I don't normally want to be off the ground any higher than I can jump, which isn't far. But for some reason, I just love what the fear does to me. My wife, Michelle, not so much. Uh, a few years back, uh, we found ourselves at California Adventure right across from Disneyland. And if you've ever been there, you know uh, that um, they, have, they have a few coasters, not very many. Uh, we went out to visit my son Landon for this occasion. And, and he and his wife, Mackenzie, were living out there at the time, serving in church in Anaheim, and, or near Anaheim. And Hannah, our daughter, was there because she's, I don't know, she was always up for a good time. And so anyway, they have a pretty good coaster there called the Increda Coaster. And it's fun. It has a loop and a couple of steep drops. But anybody who's a roller coaster enthusiast, it would, would, they would never call it daring, right? But it's fun. Uh, but for Michelle, it was like climbing Mount Everest. And uh, somehow I talked her into going on the Incredit Coaster. And I, I'm not going to tell you exactly what the experience was like, but I, I am going to show you a picture of Michelle moments after the ride. Here, here it is. Um, <laughs> That's my brave little coaster girl. Uh, This was, literally, she held this pose for 20 minutes and I was very empathetic for about 10 and then I was like, hey, uh, we're missing the other rides, could you? You And uh, I will tell you that she's never been on a roller coaster since, that was 2015, and my guess is she'll never get on one again. So some of us like that roller coaster feeling when we're in an amusement park, the ups and downs. But almost all of us don't really enjoy that in real life. And when it comes to hope, there is such a thing as a hope roller coaster. I know people who have been trying to have kids for years, and my heart just breaks when I think about that. I can't imagine the pain of infertility. Talk about a hope roller coaster. I've had people tell me in the last month about addictions they can't seem to kick I've talked with people who are experiencing health problems that even the doctors don't know what's going on. I know of marriages that are on their last leg. And just when you think you know what it's going to take to get out of that situation or pass that experience, you get let down. It's the roller coaster of hope. And maybe you're riding it this Christmas. And what I want you to understand is that I'm not just talking about a history lesson about messiahs and slavery and the Davidic line, it's about hope. When Jesus came as the Messiah, his last name wasn't Christ. Christ is a title. It's the Greek word for Messiah. And in, and in Matthew and in Luke, that, those are the two gospels that cover the lineage of Jesus, the family tree. They're doing that so that it will connect Jesus to David, which is what the prophets did. So many were excited at first, they got their hopes up, but then they turned on him or lost interest in him because he didn't turn out to be the kind of leader they expected. Everyone expected the Messiah would be this great military mind, that he would be an economic genius, that he would be a political savior, that he would rid the country of Roman occupation and reestablish David's kingdom, that he would right the wrongs, carve out a path for his people to be back on top. But Jesus actually came and just said, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. And this kingdom is about more than just solving the immediate political problem 
It was a much bigger story that he was writing. If you remember, the kids sang that amazing new song from Phil Wickham, Manger Throne, today. And there's a line in that song that I love. It says, but he wrote a better story, a much bigger story. And how did they respond to all of this? Well, they turned on him and they killed him. They crucified him. Because they had their entire life resting on circumstantial hope. And it's so easy to do. We do the same thing. We have an epidemic of circumstantial hope in our world. It's reflected in our prayers. God, my hope is in you, provided that you answer my prayers on time, to my liking, and in a way I can understand. Now, we don't actually pray that way, but that's, that's the expectation. It's the kind of God we all want. So our hope rests in circumstances. You don't hear this story at Christmas time all that often because the story takes place the night after Jesus' resurrection, the Sunday evening. Um, but it's really important to study hope with it. It starts with a couple of Jesus' disciples talking and walking along the road to a village called Emmaus. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, Luke 24, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that happened. Now, we learn a few verses later that one of the disciples, his name is Cleopas. That was a man's name at the time, at the day, in that day. There were two of them, though, and we don't know the name of the other disciple, which is a little bit frustrating, but we just don't know. I have a guess, okay? I think the other disciple was a woman because it says in the scripture they were talking with each other, and I think if it's two dudes, I don't think they're talking. I just don't. <laughs> and they're just walking down the road, quiet. There's no need to speak. Why should we speak? So I feel like this is male and female, but that's just a hunch. So these two people are, are followers of Jesus. They're walking back home the Sunday after Jesus was crucified. Now, a little quiz, okay? What happened the Sunday after Jesus was crucified? Yeah, yeah, he was, it's not a trick question. He was resurrected, okay? He came back to life, that's exactly right. But they had not received this news, apparently. They they didn't know, okay? They, They, maybe they had heard a rumor, but they didn't believe it. Now, one other thing, this is interesting. The guy I mentioned earlier, Judas Maccabeus, he had this successful revolt, right? And he was, he was a pretty successful leader and then he got crushed and he got killed, okay? This is very interesting. Judas Maccabeus was from Emmaus, the same village they were from. So think about that just for a second. Judas Maccabeus, hoped by many to be Messiah, then killed. Jesus, loved and hoped by many to be the Messiah, now killed. They knew and were from a town that understood the roller coaster of hope. So you pick it back up, uh, Luke 24, verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. They didn't know him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along the road? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas said, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? So Cleopas was almost a little cynical to him. Uh, What things, Jesus said. About Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and other rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped, there's that word again, for the two on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus died, their hope died with him. Now Jesus is actually, his response was a little intense. How foolish are you and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And it says down in verse 17, and the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He did the same thing I just did for you. He just gave them a a timeline of the history of people and why Advent was real and why they should have been expecting it. And eventually their eyes were open and they saw Jesus for who he really was. And those two people, those two disciples from Emmaus might have hoped for a Messiah who would free them from Roman oppression, but what they got was so much better. 
Hope came crashing into the reality because Jesus was a Messiah who freed them from their sins. Their hope was not tied to circumstance. So, let me ask you. What's the one thing you brought in here with you today that you've got a lot riding on that if your ship doesn't come in, well, you'd be devastated? What are you hoping in? My guess is there's not a person in the room today or even watching online who hasn't made a similar statement. We had hoped. We had hoped this was gonna be the position, the career, the job we had dreamed of. We had hoped the company downsizing wouldn't reach us. We had hoped we could have a child or another child or someone else's child through adoption. We had hoped we had hoped we had seen the last of cancer in our family. We had hoped our, our son, our daughter, had, was finally getting their act together. We had hoped our marriage was going to last forever. We had hoped. And those are circumstantial things. And friends, I just want to say this. No matter what or who you hope in, if it's not hope in the resurrected Jesus, it's going to let you down. I mean... If there's anything I've learned in my life as a pastor is that if you give something enough time, friend, it doesn't matter what it is, it will eventually let you down, okay? The most noble of causes and the best of people will let you down. I mean, I've been the pastor here for more than two decades. We just started our 22nd year here. And I'm certain, certain that I've let many people down over the last 20 years maybe even people in the room today. It's just, it's just what we fallible human beings have in common. Thanks for hanging in there with me, by the way, because you're still here. But Jesus frees us from the roller coaster of hope, from circumstantial hope, and he gives us real hope, everyday hope, which is so important to understand because there's a huge difference between giving up on a circumstance and giving up on God. There are times when the circumstances will not play out like we plan, but that does not have to cause us to give up our hope in God. So let me ask you again. What are you hoping for? What hope roller coaster are you riding? And maybe you, you're here today and you're not hoping for anything because you're beyond that. In your mind, the situation that you're worried about is hopeless. But as we light the first candle this season of Advent, the hope candle, as we light it, the prophecy candle, I want us to remember something. I want us to remember that we're celebrating a hope that never disappoints. And God wants us to see that Christmas changed everything. That the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Light in the midst of darkness. Christine Kane uh, is one of my favorite communicators, and she said recently, sometimes when you're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but you've actually been planted. And I love that. There have been times where I have felt buried, but I was planted. And you know, one of the reasons I love the Bible so much is because when you study, sometimes when you study the, the Old Testament coming into the New Testament and you study the children of Israel and you're reading all these stories, you're like, how in the world do I have anything in common with these people? And the truth is we have everything in common with them. And I'll tell you why. Because they were living in a space in between. They were the people who were living between creation and the birth of Jesus, and they waited so long. They waited even 400 years after the prophets declared that Jesus was going to be the Messiah. They were living in the space in between. They were living in a not yet that seemed like a not ever. And you and I are the same kind of people. We are people who are living in the era of the in-between we are living in between the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we are living in the not yet that seems like a not ever. 
And it just feels like we're just waiting. Waiting for God to make things right. My all-time favorite quote is about waiting. It's from Lewis Smedes, author, theologian. He writes, waiting is our destiny. As creatures who cannot by themselves bring about what they hope for, we wait in darkness for a flame we cannot light. We wait in fear for a happy ending that we cannot write. We wait for a not yet that feels like a not ever. Waiting is the hardest work of hope. And some of you understand that. We wait for the not yet, but we wonder if it's a not ever. And I wish I could say something right now, some magic words that would make the not yet come to reality for you, but I'm afraid that I can't. But I can tell you that hope is real, that you aren't buried, that you've been planted, and we can have everyday hope in the one who has never failed us. And it's true that we are the people who are caught in between, waiting for the not yet that feels like a not ever. So we want to encourage you to celebrate Advent with us this year. Um, We had these wreaths available, uh, but unfortunately they sold out by the end of 8.30. So a little short-sighted on that order this time. That's my fault. But we would love for you to celebrate Advent. We're going to have some of these available for you next week if you would like to purchase them and just... the the gold rings and the candles so you could start maybe a new tradition in your family if you've never done that before and uh, if you don't want to wait till next week honestly you can just go to Amazon right (laughs) type in Advent wreath you can they'll send one to you but the reason I want us to to take this serious is I want to prepare us and our hearts because we need to celebrate that he came but we also need to anticipate his coming again And let me assure you, when he comes again, it will not be like the first time. The first time Jesus came, he came in weakness. When he comes again, it'll be in strength and power. The first time he came as a baby in a manger, when he comes again, it'll be a mighty king. The first time he came as a servant, when he comes again, it'll be a sovereign ruler. First time he came, he came to die. When he comes again, the dead will raise back to life. The first time he came, he came riding on a donkey. When he comes again, he'll be riding on a white horse. First time he came, he came as a lamb. When he comes again, he'll be a roaring lion. The first time he came, the world barely noticed. When he comes again, believe me, friend, believe me, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we can experience hope when we let him be the Lord. We can experience hope when we let him be the Lord of our life, both today and forever. Let's pray over this. God, we love you. We are so thankful, so thankful that we get to celebrate Christmas and help us to never forget that hope is real, that hope has a name, and that his name is Jesus. We thank you so much for that. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Man, what a powerful message in worship today, talking about hope, talking about the prophecy candle. Hey, listen, with me right now, I've got my good friend, Sarah Lewis, who is our Roanoke Children's Pastor. So Sarah, so thankful that you're here today. I'm excited to and be here. I love the Christmas stuff here at Roanoke. It's I so know, good. It's so fun and pretty. Oh, this, this, I love it is so fun and pretty. Now, what is something that you're looking forward to this Christmas season? I love the Christmas services at Compass. Yeah. We see a lot of the same extended family every year come out. So we get to see them every year. Yeah. And it is hopping here at Roanoke. So Absolutely. It's, awesome. no, it's so good. Well, listen, we would love for you to share your takeaway in the chat today. And listen, make sure you scan the QR code, fill out the first time guest connection form. We'd love to send you a gift as a way of saying thank you for joining us today for the experience. It's a red journal, very Christmassy oh, journal, by the way. It's so that. great. I'm going to send that to you, but also it allows me the opportunity.
opportunity to reach out to you and see how I can pray for you because I really think that whatever situation or circumstance you find yourself in today, we want to pray you through that. Now, tell us a little bit about the children's ministry here at Roanoke. Yeah, so um, I've been here for about four years, which wow. I love. Yeah, my husband Nathan and I have been here five years, but I've yeah. been the children's Love Nathan, before. he's the man. Yeah, um, and we just love it. We have awesome kids programming from three months to fifth grade, um, and our kids love it. They come out every week knowing something. It's not child care. It's actually biblical knowledge that they walk awesome. away with, um, awesome. and so we love Compass Kids. Yeah. And well, listen, if you're new to DFW, maybe you're close to the Roanoke area, man, come check out the Roanoke campus. We'd love to see you guys here. Thank you so much for joining us. Say, take care. Be here next week as we continue in our series countdown to Christmas. God bless. Thank you.